It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, Steve. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. You're going to hear about banking in language everybody can understand. That's right. Up first on today's program, we'll welcome back economist Nomi Prinz. In her latest book, Permanent Distortion, she chronicles how central banks and government leadership artificially juiced the financial sector in response to the Great Recession of 2008. She argues that in the 15 years since, the market grew addicted to that sweet, sweet central bank money, an addiction enabled by compliant policymakers. What did that get us? A huge gap between the high-flying stock market versus back down here on Earth, where average people struggle to make ends meet. And we wonder why so many people distrust government institutions and gravitate toward right-wing demagogues. We'll speak to Ms. Prinz about the causes and consequences of our financial funhouse, as well as the need for a dramatic course of correction. As always, we'll check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber, too. But first, how did our economy become so fragile? David? Nomi Prinz is an economist, author, geopolitical financial expert, and financial historian. She's the author of several books, including Collusion, How Central Bankers Rig the World, All the President's Bankers, Other People's Money, The Corporate Mugging of America, and It Takes a Pillage, Behind the Bonuses, Bailouts, and Backroom Deals from Washington to Wall Street. Her latest book is Permanent Distortion, How Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Nomi Prinz. Thank you so much for having me back on Crazy Times. Well, welcome back, Nomi. David didn't cover your business experience in Wall Street. Could you give us an idea of who you worked for and when you left? Certainly, yes. I worked for four banks. I was a managing director at Goldman Sachs. That was the, the last bank that I worked at when the Enron crisis popped up in WorldCom and so forth. And I wound up leaving the industry because of all the corruption that was well, see, bubbled into those events, the bank's role in it. I had been in banking for 15 years at that point. I had worked as well for Bear Stearns in London. I was a senior managing director there. I created and grew my own analytics group that covered financial investments across the world prior to which I was at Lehman Brothers in New York. And prior to that, I got my start on Wall Street when I was 19. Apparently, some records had to be changed on that one at the Chase Manhattan Bank. So keeping score, uh, two of the banks that I worked at are the largest investment bank and the largest sort of commercial bank in the United States right now, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs. And two of them were casualties of over leverage and the subprime crisis of 2008 and what we're seeing right now is to an extent, a lot of similarities to that period. Well, before we get into that, why did you leave what we can call Wall Street? I mean, you had very <laughs> responsible positions and you decided you've had enough, why? Yeah, so a couple of things ultimately coalesced for me personally when I left in 2002. Now, over 20 years ago, my position at Goldman Sachs, which, yes, was a very high position. I ran two groups there. I had a corner office, the whole nine yards. And a number of things happened at that same time. One, it was right after 9-11. And the general atmosphere of what had happened, not just because of the World Trade Center attacks, but because of what was going on before that and during that and after that on Wall Street, sort of the, the general corruption, the general connection of what banks were enabling other corporations to do in terms of misleading investors, cooking their books, tanking the economy and so forth. And at that point, I had also come from, prior to being at Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, where you know, into the late 90s, of course, there was an accumulation of debt around the world. While I was working in banking at the time in London, I was also marching in demonstrations for Jubilee 2000 in Birmingham. So even at the time, I mean, it took me a couple of years to ultimately quit. I recognized that what we were doing and how we were doing it inside the banking system was deeply painful economically to millions of individuals, perhaps billions, and, and also to countries around the world. And I wanted to talk about it. And at the time that I left, I think I was the only person from inside Wall Street who was openly talking about on the news through my first book, Other People's Money, which you saw, I know, Ralph, back in the day about what was really going on inside. 
And other people have sort of added to that over the years, but I needed to do it. I could not be inside and not be public about what was going on. And so I quit. And you did it. You were predicting right time and time again. We've had people on the show talking about money and banking, and they almost leave the audience behind. It's really an interesting cultural situation. We've been described as a materialistic society interested in money over the generations. And yet the vast majority of the people are not given an opportunity to learn about money and banking and the Federal Reserve. Everything's sort of a mystery. And it isn't really a mystery. As one prosecutor once said when he was asked about all the complicated schemes that go under the rubric of corporate crime, he said, look, when you get down to it, it's all about lying, cheating, and stealing. And you've been able to really clarify all this. So the theme of your book is when you say, quote, it is abundantly clear that our world is divided in two very different economies. The real one for the average worker is based on productivity and results under the traditional rules of money and economics. The other doesn't abide by these rules. It is the product of loose money poured by central banks into a system dominated by financial giants powerful enough to send stock markets higher, even in the face of a global pandemic and threats of nuclear war. Give us the elaboration on that, because people see it every day. I mean, there are people who make a lot of money from money, the old moneylender's legacy, and there are people who make money, not as much, from producing real goods and services. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and that has been a tenant of our current capitalism for some time. But what I try to do is look at sort of how how that's happened. I mean, beyond the, the corruption, which is prevalent, and beyond, and I'll, I'll add to your list of three there, the, the hiding of it, you know, so there, there's the crime and then there's the cover up. And that's generally a series of accounting maneuvers on the books of, of a lot of these institutions and sheer lack of examining what's going on until it's too late on the part of, of regulators who are supposed to be doing that. The bottom line is, and what I talk about in permanent distortion, is that there is a source a sort of new source in a way of money or an amplified source that has presented itself since the 2008 crisis. And and that, that is the central bank, that is the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world. What do I mean by central banks? They're basically sort of government or quasi government, depending on the country, institutions that can effectively fabricate, create money out of nothing and inject it or sort of give it to the financial system in return for what they take back out, which is generally government debt. And to unpack that, what it's basically saying is you got institutions who can decide how to create money and where it goes. And generally, it goes through the financial system, and it pumps up more so from 2008, and there's been periods of ups and downs, including the pandemic. But but since that time, on an amplified basis, the markets, you know, financial assets, things that don't have actual real tangible physical sort of value can be manipulated or, or pumped up very quickly because money is coming in so quickly and so abundantly to allegedly help that system. And then so it gets left behind the real worker, real assets, companies that make real things because it takes longer for any kind of money or money investment or, or wages, et cetera, to make its way through the real economy, through these companies, through building a bridge or fixing a highway or creating a hospital or enhancing an education system. All of these things take a lot of planning and time and will and and the money itself. I look at in this particular book, Permanent Distortion, as just this external thing that flits about depending on where it's coming from and where it's going to. And it goes more quickly again into financial assets and into things that take more time and have more conversation and have more bureaucracy and have more attention and just take longer. And so this permanent distortion started, I'm not permanently, as you mentioned, this is something that we've seen for years. But in 2008, this became a new system. The monetary system, central banks were able to, in an unlimited fashion, and they did create money and give it to the financial system that pumped up markets, financial assets. That happened again in the wake of the pandemic in 2020, where they basically doubled all of those efforts. So anything that had happened in the wake of the financial crisis that took a few years in terms of their policy, in terms of creating money to do, to help the financial system, to help Wall Street, happened in turbo-boosted time in the wake of the pandemic, allegedly to help the real economy. 
And as I talk about in the book, and as we have seen subsequently, the real economy did not benefit from the amount of money that was pumped through the banking system into the markets. We then have a situation where inflation gets high, the Fed steps back, money comes out a little bit, markets go down. And then we have a situation where a big bank collapses and it's all, it's all go again. And this is the idea of permanent distortion is that when the financial system needs it, it gets the money and a lot of it and in an uncapped way and in an unregulated way and in a non-transparent way. And when the real economy needs it, it's years of debate. It's a lot of just headache, really, congressionally, regulatorily, and for the average worker in the process. Let's step back, Nomi, just historically. About 90 years ago, the brilliant economist John Maynard Keynes set off an alarm when he said, stock markets, this is in the 1930s, stock mm -hmm. markets are spending more money in speculation and less in investment. And I don't think people realize that the investment purpose of the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ is very minimal now. And that real investment in things that matter like infrastructure creates real jobs. It's coming more and more from government. And those are the Biden infrastructure bills. Now, fast forward, we've never had more speculation. It used to be that Wall Street would speculate in bonds and stocks. Mm -hmm. And then some decades ago, they started going into options, puts and calls. And puts and calls are bets mm -hmm. on stocks and bonds, which in effect are supposed to reflect the real economy, the, you know, to the extent there is consumer purchases, investment, and the like. Now they're into derivatives, which are bets on bets on bets. And I've had people on Wall Street who were in at the beginning of the option industry say they can no longer understand these derivatives. Only a few mathematicians can even understand the complexities. Well, some of them crashed in 2008, obviously, and brought the economy down, unemployed 8 million workers, produced a huge taxpayer bailout, as a lot of people know. But the legitimacy of the banking industry is that they convey investment, not gambling, not speculation. The marketplace is a form of casino. Business Week once had a cover years ago saying casino capitalism. And that's what it really is. If you talk to brokers and you say, look, what are people doing here? Well, they're just guessing. You know, they're putting bets in the market. It's not quite as loose as Las Vegas. But it's pretty close to a sophisticated form of gambling. On the other hand, there's no sales tax on these purchases. So people in New York City, even people on Wall Street, they'll go to a delicatessen and they'll pay a 6 7% sales tax or a clothing store. But if someone bought $100 million worth of Exxon Mobil stock, there is no sales tax because Wall Street is powerful in Albany and Washington. And you know all this and you've conveyed it. And you've even, I think, been participating in efforts led by the Nurses Labor Union of all unions to get a less than 1% sales tax on all the stock bond and derivative speculation would produce hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And it's basically a progressive sales tax because most of the trading is done by upper income people. So let's say you were testifying before the Senate or House Banking Committee, especially after the shakiness of the Silicon Valley Bank that collapsed and Signature Bank, on whose board is Barney Frank, the former co-author of the Dodd-Frank bill. How would you structure the banking industry? There, people are saying, what's its legitimacy? Why not just nationalize it? Right now, it owns the Federal Reserve. That's where the Federal Reserve gets its money. It doesn't get its budget from Congress. The only agency that doesn't gets it from bank fees. And the bankers are all over the regional Federal Reserve banks in Dallas and New York and Philadelphia. How would you avoid all these cyclical collapses and then the taxpayer ultimately bails out, although they say it's not the taxpayer because the Fed can print money? How would you deal with this? You know, this is basically a corporate state. It's so Wall Street controlling Washington. When Citigroup was about to fail in 2008, it was bailed out with hundreds of billions of dollars, some subsidies, some loan guarantees, in a private meeting with Secretary Henry Paulson and the head of the Federal Reserve in Washington. They got together in an office in the U.S. Treasury on Saturday and Sunday, and then on Monday they announced the bailout. 
And Paulson told the Washington Post, this is stunning. He said, you know, we didn't have any authorities to do what we did, but, quote, somebody had to do it, end quote. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) how would you structure the system? Yeah, I mean, all, all that is just insane. If you think about it in terms of the fact that all of what you just said, Ralph, all of how it has been presented to the public, and this is what I would say to the banking committee, and, and I have said to members of the banking committee over the past couple of decades, is that you got to understand, I, I me talking to them, that what Wall Street does, and I, I, Wall Street is a sort of collective you know, sort of title for leveraged lenders like SVB, like Silicon Valley Bank, like Signature, like Silvergate, but but also as representative of the asset managers, as well as the banks, is that, you know, this is an entity that effectively gets a lot of money and a lot of help in terms of how it places that money and when it is in trouble, more so than any individual, more so than any organization, more so than any union, more so than any, any initiative. That happens. And as a result, it is always a tax on the American public. There, there's no such thing as this bailout didn't cost taxpayers money because, in the absence of there being a direct through line that's made obvious to people and obvious to senators, to Congress people, money that goes into the banking system does not go into the real economy, which means there is a shortfall in the real economy, which means that money can't be reallocated into the real economy, whether that is to build bridges or hospitals or enhance our education system or help workers, because it's going somewhere else. And that's the fundamental thing that first needs to be understood. If that can be understood, that no matter what you call it, It is misplacing money that could be going into the real economy and real people into the financial system. That's just a platform. Now on from that, what do you do? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve from the get-go was predicated on the lie that it was needed in order to help get money across the country from Wall Street when there was a problem in the Wall Street banking community. It was basically presented as some sort of a public institution that would help the smaller banks in the country when the larger banks couldn't lend and to allow them to continue to do that, help the farmers in the middle of the country and so forth on out the rest of the country. The reality is, as you mentioned, Ralph, and is, is the case, the Federal Reserve is run by bankers. Its members are bankers. That's that's not a speculating. That's, that's actually what it is. Those members pay fees. Those members have shares in the Federal Reserve. And yet the Federal Reserve doesn't have to be accountable even though what it does is is deeply impactful on the real economy to the government. And over the last hundred and something years, since 1913, um, December 1930, when it was created, there has been no act. Congress has not stood up and said, look, we need to basically have control over this institution or get rid of it because it's just dislocating, you know, the entire relationship between money, speculation, and the real economy. And and we have seen that again, going back to Silicon Valley Bank. You know, we, we have these isolated hearings on the Hill about what happened to this bank. And there's a teeny bit of conversation about how that relates to the general banking system. It should be the opposite. We should not look at Silicon Valley Bank, even though it was badly managed as sort of that bad apple. We really do have to look at the full orchard and the Senate and Congress do have to do that and say, look, we don't have a regulated banking system, yet we support it when we need to support it. We don't have a distinction between the investment bank and the depositors of any institution. We got rid of that in 1999 when we abandoned and abolished the Glass-Steagall Act that separated the two. And there are people that will say, well, SVB has nothing to do with Glass-Steagall, and that's just simply wrong. Any over-leveraged in the banking system that can take down the rest of the banking system or that can create that sort of lack of confidence, instability, creation of money to save it that doesn't go into the real economy is a part of that problem. Well, here's the question that people always ask, and they've asked you and they've asked anybody who's ever studied banking. How can the Federal Reserve print money? How can the banks create money under the Federal Reserve system? And is there any limit to how much money the Federal Reserve can print? I'm so glad you asked that question. There, there is no limit. There is no congressional limit. There is no internal Federal Reserve limit. There is no limit within the banking community where that even gets discussed. There is no limit. And before the financial crisis of 2008, when the Fed took its book from 800 or so billion dollars, meaning they created 800 billion dollars worth of money in return for treasury bonds from the banking system as reserves 
on the Federal Reserve's book against which they gave money over the years. It went from 800 billion to four and a half trillion in literally, basically, you know, sort of a couple of years, a bit less than that. In the process of which they brought rates down to zero. So they made the availability of money, the cost of money to the banking system zero, right? So what we did in the wake of the pandemic was the Federal Reserve doubled that. So it went from four, well, it was down a bit from four and a half trillion. They had some bonds run off, but it basically went up to $9 trillion. So they basically created over $9 trillion over the period of time between uh, pre-2008 through 2020. And now it's about that amount. They, they let some roll off, SVB happens, banking crisis happens, they create more money. Now, the other question you ask is how do they do that? They do that electronically. They do that by effectively, you know, as if they're sort of the accountant to all the banks that are member banks of the Federal Reserve that pay, basically that, that, that sort of pay by giving reserves to the Federal Reserve is supposed to be like an insurance to if they do have problems. That's the entire supposed concept. <laughs> but what actually happens is the, the reserves that the banks have at the Federal Reserve, the money or the, the bonds they give, don't mean anything relative to the amount of money that the Federal Reserve can create to get more of them. And so that's what, what, what ultimately happens. But the Fed, it electronically creates this relationship with its banks and says, we'll take your treasuries and we'll effectively provide you money in return for those treasuries. And that money doesn't actually exist until that transaction happens. And um, that's the reality. And again, there's no limit. It's not just this, this uh, the Fed, it's, it's other central banks around the world. But the Federal Reserve sets the tone and certainly has since 2008 for what other central banks around the world do. I wrote about that in my book, Collusion, how central bankers rig the world. So that's how it happens, literally by, by electronic you know, sort of magic, because of the fact but, that- But it never, that. this money, as you point out in your book, this money never goes into the real economy to create jobs, public infrastructure, et cetera. It doesn't go into it. It just swirls around. It's called liquidity, and it juices the stock market. Isn't that what happens? That's what happened. It, it juices the, the leverage or the, the sort of risk that, that's inherent in the banking system. Because what happens is this. Let's say I'm J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm one of the, the largest you know, shareholders because there's a percentage shareholdership of the Federal Reserve. I basically get money back each year from the Federal Reserve anyway, like I would from buying a share. I get dividends back from the Federal Reserve. But let's say I have a problem. I have a liquidity issue, meaning I need money quickly because it's something that happened on my books on other banks that I will deal with or whatever, confidence crises, et cetera. So the Federal just says, okay, I'm going to create a trillion dollars. I'm just making this up because we don't know what went to JP Morgan Chase going back to the prior question. But let's say, let's call it a trillion dollars. So here's a trillion dollars. You give us a trillion dollars worth of, of, of some of the bonds on your book, treasuries, mortgages, you know, we'll take them, we'll keep them for you, and we'll give you money. How does that money go into the markets instead of into the real economy? Well, JP Morgan Chase has the option because again, there's no regulation to tell them otherwise or to make them do otherwise, to use any and all of that money to trade their own positions, to invest in speculative securities, to not give out to small businesses, to not give out to small depositors in different forms of credit or certainly cheaper forms of credit like they would to corporations. They, they have all of the choice. And what happens in practice is that it's easier to speculate it's easier to bet on the markets with that extra money backing you than it is to lend to a small business. Why? Because it's faster. The returns are quicker. And even if it's a bet and it goes wrong, you can be on both sides of that bet. I'm oversimplifying buying JP Morgan's business, but this is what happens throughout the banking system. And this is why the money doesn't get into the real economy. Or if it does in, in tiny little bits, like I think of it like a teacup where you know you fill the teacup and that's all the, the money that goes into the markets through the banking system. And yeah, it dribbles along the side. And yeah, some of it gets into the real economy. There is still lending going on, but the banks control what that is. And there is no string attached to the money that they get in terms of where that money has to go. And as a result, it goes to the easiest, quickest place. That's speculative. And that's why we see crisis after crisis. If it's not with J.P. Morgan Chase, because they have the benefit of having such a large bank, having so many depositors and having such a strong relationship with the government and with the Fed, then it's these sort of mid-sized banks, some of which are poorly managed, some of which are caught in currently a policy shift by the Federal Reserve that, that shows them for the risky banks that they are. But in either case, that money, it doesn't have to go into the real economy. There is no mechanism to make that happen. You know, Ralph, I spoke at the Fed in 2015. Janet Yellen was in the room. She talked about how the banking system was sound. It was for an internal conference. And Mike, the question they asked me at the time, Ralph, was how come Wall Street isn't lending more to Main Street? This was the topic I was supposed to address inside the Federal Reserve. 
And I said very simply, because you have not made them. And that remains true. That remains true. There, there is no string attached to the money banks can get, particularly the bigger ones, when they are in trouble. Well, you know, everybody now knows these big banks are too big to fail, which means the government, which means the taxpayer, is always required to bail them out. Required by who? By a toady Congress and a Federal Reserve. So we have basically a giant financial industry that is too big to fail with all the perverse incentives of taking more and more risks with the other people's money, title of one of your books, because they know that if something teeters over the edge, Uncle Sam will pull it back and make sure that none of the top executives get any pay cut. The top executives make about $15,000 an hour on an eight-hour day, 40 hours a week. Okay, well, George Will, who's you know about as conservative a syndicated columnist and television commentator as you could get, once said, if these big banks are too big to fail, they should be too big to exist. Okay. He never wrote the consequence of that comment, which would be the nationalization of these banks. So one time I was campaigning in Arkansas, and a guy came up, as you always experience, he starts talking about monetary theory and fiat money and all that. Mm -hmm. And another guy jumps up when we were talking about the Federal Reserve creating money, printing money. He said, if the Federal Reserve prints money as much as it wants, how do I get some of that? Right. Well, you see, <laughs> that's the point. They live in two worlds. The financial world is a cocoon that swashes around money with the Federal Reserve juicing it. And then there's the real world that makes the day daily producing goods and services. The electricians, the plumbers, the auto workers, the, the what they now call the refuse workers, the nurses. And they're the ones who sweat it out and can't pay their bills. So do you think we're ever going to have enough pressure on Congress by an aroused public unless they know at least something about the money system the way the farmers did in 1887 when they actually had discussions about different financial reforms, very sophisticated compared to today? I mean, isn't that where the hope is, that there's got to be at least 1% or 2% of the people in congressional districts who know what kind of changes have to be made? So that's a hope. And I think, and you've certainly been doing this way more than, than I have, but in the 20 years I've been talking to Washington and members since, since I've been out and just sort of looking at that entire expanse of time and you know, on both sides of the aisle, et cetera, people in and out, long-term, short-term, is that there remains, except you know, in the hands of a few people, a sheer lack of understanding of why and how the financial system and the Federal Reserve and the acquiescence of Congress comes together to basically sort of steal from the real economy and from all those groups that you mentioned. Even today, there's this idea that Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell can somehow change inflation, supply and demand, service costs, et cetera, by sort of attacking the labor force, raising rates, and wanting the economy, quote, to cool down, right? And then on the other side of that, you get a bank failure, a couple, but, you know, that we just had recently, and they print $300 billion, right, that goes into the financial system. Now, that $300 billion can be used in a lot of different ways. And I'm not advocating for the Fed to be in charge of financing the country, but what needs to happen is that Congress needs to specifically understand how the current scenario, the current makeup of the Fed, the relationship of the Treasury Fed and the banking system, the financial system, the markets, and so forth, does implicitly take away from the real economy, again, a, a, as a base, and only then can they change. I would have thought that in the financial crisis period, and when Dodd-Frank was being discussed, that there would have been a lot more, including a resurrection of, of a Glass-Steagall, a true divide, so that if a bank fails, they fail, their depositors are not, you know, sort of the negative recipients of any other speculation or over leverage they've done in other parts of the bank. They're separate, like the FDIC is supposed to insure them, and we don't therefore bail out to a much larger extent any part of the financial system each time there's a crisis. But that's not the case, because even though it was like over a thousand pages, that bill was not strong enough. And subsequent to which, as a bipartisan past bill, subsequent to which we've had more deregulation in, in the banking system of the kind that's enabled banks like Silicon Valley Bank to skirt even basic regulatory you know, necessities, you know, having money aside in case they have a crisis, you know, being required to manage 
their assets better. And so we need to basically divide out the banks. We do need to make them small. We do need to keep the depositors away from the speculation because it's it's only in that way that we don't, whatever you call it, have these bailouts that impact the overall economy by moving money into the places that don't benefit it. And that's what's necessary. That's just the bottom line. Do I think that's going to happen? I mean, if it didn't happen after the financial crisis, it's not even being discussed right now. Again, SVB is considered a bad apple. You know, I, I don't know. I do know that there's a couple of things that could also happen. I know that Marcy Kaptur is, is, is reinstituting a Glass-Steagall Resurrection Act through Congress in the wake of SVB. And she's been very out of Ohio. She's been very focused on that over the years as well. Of course, you know, there, there was a companion bill through the Senate that should be reissued as well through Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and so forth. So, so all that stuff needs to be resurrected, but more people need to understand this is this is not about you know the government overstepping or over-regulating or nationalizing the banks. We're nationalizing the banks every single day. By bailing them out. This is about creating a, a real economy that, that actually benefits from the money that's sloshing around our system as opposed to is the sort of victim of where it goes. And I think that ultimately is what we need. I know some of our listeners, because they give us feedback, are saying to me, Ralph, ask Nomi about modern monetary theory. I mean, it was only a matter of time before somebody came up with that. And others want to know about alternative currencies like the Ithaca dollar at the local level, or the time dollar, you have a currency in hours. People basically provide hours of time to other people, and they reciprocate, whether it's tutoring students in return for the students shoveling the sidewalk or cutting the grass. First, tell us what's your take on modern monetary theory. Explain it very briefly, and then what's your opinion? So my opinion on modern, modern monetary theory is, first of all, it's, it, it's not modern. It's been something that's been kicked around since the 70s. But the idea of it and how it's been sort of reintroduced more recently and in the wake of the pandemic more so it, is that, you know, if we can create money, which we know we can, how come that money can't go more directly into the hands of the real economy, into specific initiatives and sort of be used more equally? My problem with that is that in our current system, where we have the Federal Reserve constructed as it is, where we don't have a cap on how much of that money can go into the banking system, and we don't have a, a sort of paper electronic trace of where it goes and how it goes and no strings attached to it, and we have such a, you know, frankly, dysfunctional, on a lot of levels, Congress in terms of figuring out what needs to be done and where money needs to go, that in practice, I see it as a very challenging theory. And also, if we can create money, then one of the other things I think about it is that, you know, talking about currencies, with the dollar being sort of the major currency, it also, the idea of creating money, it, it's happening now with banking too. It would, it would not be different with money also being sort of created and going into the real economy, is that all of this really creates a mirage of how we should be positioning the real economy. I personally think that we should have, for example, an infrastructure bank, a national bank of some sort that specifically is funded, if we're going to do monetary theory or if we're going to even do some sort of strings attached to what the Fed can create, that is specifically funded with our debt as it already exists and not, not sort of refunded, not new taxes, but that is specifically charged with putting money into the real economy, into real projects. I, I think that's a more efficient way of doing it than even from the government standpoint than even any other type of mechanism that, that relates to the Fed or the Treasury Department. Now on the issue of currency, obviously, you know, the idea of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, time currencies, et cetera, there's different ways of looking at it. On, on the sort of idea of the sort of barter currency system or, or effectively, you know, time swaps and service swaps, I think that is happening more and more anyway. And I write about this in sort of the ending chapters of permanent distortion is what's the retaliation or what, what's the future expectation of how money can work and where it can go. And part of that is, and of course, there's a lot of uncertainty and volatility in this, but part of it is, is, is in the crypto market, not in like crazy speculative cryptos, but in something more consistent that should be more regulated, that people can actually transact in amongst themselves that the Fed isn't involved in, but yet your regulators are, like Bitcoin, like a solid thing. But also there are a lot of, I'll call them apps, but basically the equivalent of B2B, P2P, or basically direct 
lending and exchanging of money online that takes place outside of the banking system. And I, I see this as growing specifically because the current financial system is so messed up and because people do want to have a direct relationship between what they buy and what they do and who's buying it and, and who's using that. I see that happening more and more. I think it should be regulated from the standpoint of these platforms not being sort of you know, criminal enterprises. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying, you know, there, there should be some scrutiny of them. But I do think there's more that have been developed. And I think there will be more that will be developed. Well, what we saw as cryptocurrency increased is the banking industry started melding into them. And 15% of the deposits in the Silicon Valley Bank were crypto currency deposits. And of course, you alluded to it, but it is a way to circumvent international laws, engage in criminal activity. I mean, cryptocurrency is right. very, very hard to control. But you do dwell on that in your book. We've been speaking with Nomi Prinz, who's out with another book of revelations, well-documented, called Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. And the publisher's public affairs. But before we have David and Steve make their comments or questions, Nomi, there is a real alternative that has some consumer groups behind it, from New Jersey to California. And a bill has been introduced in California and other states. It's to create state public banks, like yeah. the Bank of North Dakota, which has yeah. been around for over 100 years, yeah. honest, didn't experience the crash, provides traditional banking services, yes. including student loans. What's your view on that? Governor Murphy of New Jersey, who's just recently been reelected, he comes from Wall Street and he's spoken out in favor of it, but yeah. he hasn't gone any further. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you brought that up, Ralph. So public banks, as well as I think, you know, what I mentioned, a national infrastructure bank, which would be in, in the public interest and they could work together, I think are a very necessary form of banking for where we're at. You know, you mentioned North Dakota, student loans and so forth. You know, it has some of the, the lowest student loan costs to students in that state. And it also has had the benefit of, of helping the budget of that state by investing in, in sort of the local and community based initiatives as well. And so this idea of a public banking system at the smaller local level on, on up to the state level, when I say idea, I mean, the, the, the necessity for public banking is real. And, and I think we should even expand the definition of what some people think of as, as public banking into, you know, sort of banks that actually do what banks were supposed to do for individuals, localities, and communities and states, which is fund growth and, and sort of lend to individuals and not speculate um, outside. So you don't have a situation where, for example, Wells Fargo is in, you know, some small, you know, California town and, and the, when the pandemic's happening, it's, it's, it's not helping any of the local business owners on any level. And yeah, there were PPP loans and other things on the federal government level. But the, the point is, as a bank, as a lending facility, they didn't have a relationship or a obligation to local community or public banks. Part of their MO is to have that connection. To me, that's more economic than anything else, if you as a bank are involved in that locality, in that community, in that initiative, then you care about, and I say you financially care about, I'm not saying it heart cares, but it financially cares about the well-being of what goes on. And so you have this mutually reinforcing situation where, where the people that need it are getting money or, or keeping their money in an institution that actually gives back to them and to the greater community by doing that with more businesses and so forth in the area. And that actually reinforces the foundation of our economy. Our economy happens at that ground level and on up. That, that's the reality. And so there's a greater benefit even to public banks than, than simply being more stable, which they are because they would not be allowed to leverage to the extent that the other kinds of banks can by just charter that actually well, benefits the entire real economy. Well, the way the bills for public banking are structured, they are assiduously avoiding retail banking services to get the banking lobby off their back. And they're basically taking the trillions of dollars in state and local funds, the budgets, the pension funds, and basically saying, look, we're not going to operate at the whim of these gigantic fees that Wall Street is charging cities like Los Angeles and New York and Chicago and smaller cities. We're going to save those fees and we're going to use public funds that come from taxpayers in state and local budgets and municipal and state other activities for the public interest. And, right. you know, this is something that really could become 
a reality. I mean, it almost yeah. got through the California legislature. Yeah. But the business press doesn't dwell on it at all. Before we run out of time, I want your take on postal banking, which used to exist until 1967 when the banks got rid of it. People would walk into the post office, they'd be able to deposit money, get interest on it, have checking services. There's now another push by progressive forces for reinstating postal banking. They had four pilot projects under the Republican Postmaster General DeJoy, Trump's friend, and they were designed to fail. They weren't well publicized at all. One was in the Virginia suburbs. Give us your up-to-date take on postal banking. Yeah, and, and what just popped into mind when, when, when you were saying that, Ralph, is that public and postal banking are the quintessential by the people for the people, right? I mean, that that's the, the, the idea. Banking by the people, i.e. The, the taxes from us actually go to you know, securing our foundational economies through, through the public banks and, and, and local banks is actually very American in terms of you know, the ethos. And from the standpoint of postal banking, you know, it's sort of the same thing because the idea, again, in a, in a postal banking environment, the government doesn't have to worry about bailing out banks, which it seems to not care about when it actually happens. I mean, they talk about it, but, you know, we don't change that much. But the reality is a postal banking system, like a public banking system, would not have that kind of MO to take money elsewhere. There were to be actual banking activities, like you mentioned, checking deposits, interest rates that would be more like treasury bond rates as opposed to close to zero, even with treasury yields going up that the larger institutions do, and less fees because a lot of times these, these large banks charge such fees quite on a usury basis to small depositors. There's a much higher fee for people with lower amounts of money in their accounts than there is for people with larger amounts of money in their accounts. That's just the reality. Even worse, there are millions of Americans who are unbanked. As the well. banks don't want them. As well. uh, they don't right. make enough money. That's so right. if they're unbanked, we got to have postal banking right. and uh, post office all over the country. Isn't that one of the arguments? Yeah. No, exactly. And, and also you have all the other benefits that you have with banking. You just have people participating with whatever money they do have in, in sort of more of a democratic, you know, a democracy type of process, but, but also with their money. Well, you know, listeners, one thing you can all do is when you meet a candidate for office, local, state, national, you know, they run around shaking hands before the election. Just ask them questions like that. Say, what, what's your position on public banking? They get enough people asking the question. They go back to Washington and they meet their buddies in the corridors. We're getting questions about public banking here. And maybe the two committees will start having hearings. The House committee did have hearings on public banking, but it was a perfunctory hearing and it didn't get much press at all. And we haven't had any success in getting Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat from Ohio, in having thorough public banking hearings. They got to hear from you back home, people. They have to hear that it's on your mind. It's putting your hand on your pocketbook and making sure it isn't lifted. We're running out of time, Nomi. Let's go to Steve and David. Steve? Yeah, thanks, Nomi. My question is, could you really concretely connect the dots between what's going on in the banking system and the unrest on the ground that is driving people to right-wing demagogues? Yeah, great question. I cover that in thematically. I do string that through the book, through permanent distortion, because what we saw even before the pandemic was, was a rise in sort of this polar populism idea and sort of moving towards sort of, you know, popular, actually on both sides, but, you know, sort of more sort of right-wing populist sort of candidates. And then, and to an extent going back after that, but, but we saw that in a series of, you know, individuals from Trump to Bolsonaro. And I think that what drives or part of what drives that, you know, aside from other issues, but on the financial side, on, on sort of people's economy side, is the fact that people are whatever their political beliefs are disenfranchised from this entire financial system. They, they see that it's corrupt. They see that it's unfair. They see that it's unjust and they see it's not benefiting them and it's benefiting a few at the top. And I think when you are economically fragile, which most people are, that the idea of anybody who can come in there and, and sort of do something different, whether they, they have a proven track record of that or not, you know, whether they're a billionaire and have nothing to do with you or not, that it's appealing because you're in a situation where you are afraid, you are concerned, you have an economic anxiety. And I talk about this in the book and you, you need to turn somewhere and somewhere is generally away from the middle because the middle is not helping you. And the middle is mostly where a lot of politics happens. And so you're more sort of 
you're more going to take a look at those promises from the fringes. David? So the China and America, the, the war drums are deafening right now. And I, so earlier you were talking about how we can't audit the Fed. Well, we also can't audit the Pentagon. Could you speak to the connection between the strength of the dollar, the dollar serving as the global currency and the strength of our military? And if we end up going to war with China, they'll tell us it'll be over Taiwan, but is it about the dollar? It's a, a great question. Again, so a, a little mini through line in the book, but something I've, I've looked at in, in collusion as well, just the relationship between, you know, a sort of global hierarchy status, you know, as having the number one global currency through the dollar and how that's helped us militarily. I mean, this is something that was established in the wake of World War II that actually sort of established the superpower nature of the United States. I mean, the whole military industrial complex thing from Eisenhower after that, you know, to me, and I, I actually write about this in All the President's Bankers, my book was basically predicated on having a strong dollar because the economy or the, the financial economy, the currency economy, and the military are very, very linked. If, if you don't have both, which we do as a nation. You can't control both sort of trade, financial sanctions or similar things. And also, you know, the size of your military and the positioning of your military. And as it turns out, banks have expanded into areas in, in other nations throughout the world where we have military presence. It's not an accident that we did have an expansion of our financial system into specifically areas in the world where we have military presence. Those, those two things are very connected. From China's perspective, the People's Bank of China also pumps money into their country and into surrounding allied countries as well. It just does in a different way in the Fed. The Fed pumps it into our financial system, into our banks. People's Bank of China actually pumps it into more sort of government-related activities and sort of building activities and building alliances. So they have a different way of using their money, but it helps to back their position from a military standpoint, not so much as a currency, but as using the money they create to basically finance other initiatives militarily in, in oil relationships with Russia and so forth. So in the limit, if we were to have a full out you know, sort of war with, with China over Taiwan or not, I think you're, you're asking if that's just kind of potentially a ruse for, yes. for having it out. And I think you can look at almost any war. There, there's always those things that catalyze what's a bigger volume of, of tension that you know is happening around it. And, and I think there is economic and monetary tension and currency tension between the United States and China. And the military is just one manifestation of it, same as in, in any of the wars. So we have yet to see how that's going to play out, obviously. But in the wake of the financial crisis is when China actually cemented more of its superpower status because it effectively looked at our banking system and, and said this, and I have it in, in collusion and lots of speeches and so forth in the government, central bank, how badly we were at managing money as a country. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that was their ruse for establishing more of those relationships economically and militarily around the world. So it's a question of what each of our countries use to have both the economic and military senior superpower status. Is the Belts and Roads Initiative as benevolent as we are led to believe? Is it as bad as the IMF? That's a really great question. It depends uh, which country you ask. For the most part, there is a very steep price to pay for countries that take or receive money that's lent from China in terms of the relationship that they then have to have with China. You know, if you build some infrastructure in, say, Sri Lanka, how much money from that, if from poorer country, you know, China can, can sort of use into their own sort of increasing global alliance. So it's like a mixed sword. I mean, countries will take their money, but at the same time, it comes at a steep price increasingly. So that the stronger countries, for example, like in Australia, has a lot of more tension with China, even though they're not sort of in, this, in, the, in the middle of the Belt and Road thing, like, like a Thailand, like a Sri Lanka, like, like some of the, the other Southeast Asian nations. But they certainly have tension over how China gives out money and what it requires in return. That said, there are areas throughout the world, again, outside of Belt and Road, like in Africa, where China will come in and say, look, you know, we're going to give some money, we're going to pay off some officials, and we're going to get access to this particular mine and these particular you know, supplies. I was just in Australia talking about this with a number of people, and those are other ways that China sort of destabilizes some countries. At the same time, they're helping them. So it's it's a very double-edged sword. Anna? Just briefly, in your book, you touch on Charles Ponzi and the Ponzi schemes as, as kind of an analog for some of, of what has been going on in our financial system. And could you explain a bit more about that? It seems like a, 
a much more accessible way to approach this house of cards than, you know, as someone educated in America, I didn't learn much about monetary or financial policy in my K through 12 schooling. So Ponzi scheme seems like a pretty accessible way to, to understand it. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I, you know, the, the story of Ponzi, Charles Ponzi himself is, is really fascinating. He's this Italian immigrant. He comes to Boston. He tries to you know, get banks to lend him money. They don't. He gets annoyed. He comes up with the system that ultimately is called the Ponzi scheme, that basically it's a way of taking money from investors, small investors up through large investors, as people started to hear of that in return for government stamps. And effectively, he promises a higher return on that sort of process because of a, a loophole in just how government stamps, U.S. government stamps were working at the time. And he, he promises to return a lot more than people can get by just keeping their money in a bank, you know, the interest they would get on deposit. So this is in the recession period. This is going into 1920, where it's sort of the country's in a recession. It's sort of post-war, et cetera, and people are desperate. There's been a Spanish flu. I mean, a lot of kind of similarities to now, but he basically manages to capture you know, a lot of attention. He's very salesman -y. And what it is, the system itself, is the, the more people that buy into his promises of a higher return that he can't necessarily reach the more people are needed to fund those people. So it's like, you know, the thing about a Ponzi scheme is it, it's always the people that are first in get paid by the people who come in next. And that kind of keeps happening until there's no next people coming in. There's no next money coming in. And the promise of the system isn't enough to fulfill everybody. It totally collapses. And anybody who, who is left in it loses what they have. And so that's kind of what happened with Ponzi. And he, he wrote the, his memoirs from jail where he basically talks about how, how much people were willing to believe what he said and, and how he said it, you know, and, and, and so that's kind of intrinsic to this. They believed his story. So it wasn't so much about the scheme. It was about the story of the scheme. And I liken this to the Federal Reserve in that the story of the Federal Reserve, central banks, is that they are helping the real economy when, in fact, they're actually taking money yeah, from the real economy and giving it to part of the system, you know, the financial system that uses it kind of as they want and time and time again, especially since again, 2008. And as long as there's banks that are behaving, as long as money's coming into the system, as long as it's all sort of balanced, everything looks stable. But then you get an SVB or you got a Bear Stearns back in 2008 or, or whatever, or Lehman Brothers, and, and, and it's, it's, it's obvious it's not so stable. And that's when things collapse the might of the Fed is greater than the might of Charles Ponzi because they have an unlimited ability to get money, as we talked about earlier. But to me, the, the idea is, is very similar. We're almost out of time. Is there anything you want to say before we conclude? We're talking with Nomi Prinz, the author of another great book on the financial markets called Permanent Distortion, How the Financial Markets Abandoned the Real Economy Forever. Any final comments? Well, I think the main thing, and thanks so much, all of you, for having me on and talking about this issue, because the main thing about why I keep writing these books um, is to try and give people material to educate themselves so that they can act, whether it's on behalf of their own money, to learn more and to have more of a voice in potentially changing how their money is treated in the system itself. And not everybody's going to be doing that, but the education, I think, is, is very important. The reality is we have a permanent distortion between the financial markets that get lots and lots of money, inhale it, it's a speculative driver, and we have a lot less going into the real economy, which is why we basically stumble there. And while the stock market might go up and down, generally up, sometimes down, but ultimately in that trajectory, the real economy really doesn't to the same extent. And, and I think that people need to really understand why. And I hope that permanent distortion is one other piece of work that, you know, that I wrote and that's out there that can help people better understand why they feel that something is just wrong, but give them some tools to do something about it. Well, I hope your books get into some courses on money and banking at universities and colleges at the undergraduate level and the graduate level. I learned about the Federal Reserve by going to my economics class at Princeton, and the professor handed out free booklets called This is Your Federal Reserve, and it was published by the Federal Reserve. <laughs> it didn't make right. things easier that he was on the board of governors of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank. So that's what's going on, listeners, is a huge propaganda machine 
And it's interesting that the destabilization of the real economy comes so frequently from the speculation of the paper or the money or the financial economy. Thank you very much, Nomi Prince, for the book and for your work over the years. And I hope you'll get on NPR's Marketplace with Aikai Kai Rizdal. Thank you. We've been speaking with Nomi Prince. We have a link to her book, Permanent Distortion, at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute from Friday, March 31, 2023. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Corporate punishment has a branding problem. Criminal sanctions should call out wrongdoing and condemn wrongdoers. But corporate punishment falls short of these ambitions. For punishment to convey its intended message... Society must be able to hear it. That's according to a new article by Iowa law professor Mihalis Diamantis and Michigan business professor Will Thomas. The article is titled Branding Corporate Criminals. Diamantis and Thomas argue that a new sanction would brand corporate criminals. While the brand sanction could take many forms, different visual marks of varying sizes, the authors call for, at a minimum, appending a criminal designation to corporate felon's legal name and mandating its appearance on products and communications. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokheimer. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. I want to thank our guest again, Nomi Prince. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show for you podcast listeners. Stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. It's going to feature Francesco DeSantis. And in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimeReporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. We have a new issue of the Capitol Hill Citizen. It's out now. And to order your copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen, Democracy Dies in Broad Daylight, go to capitolhillcitizen.com. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreaders, Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. We'll welcome national security expert William Hartung to talk about the military budget. And peace activist Cindy Sheehan will be here to discuss the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. The latest edition of the Capitol Hill Citizen is about to come out. Check out the website, CapitolHillCitizen.com. Everybody who reads it loves it. Stand up. Oh, you should. Step up. Step up. I think you should.